as we get started, uh, and before we dive into our specific products that we want to share with you all, we want to frame our perspective on data and how we use data. Data are stories. They are stories about what's happening in our city. Um, they're these big picture stories um, about you know, what happens in the aggregate. And by shedding a light on what's happening in our city, they reflect the world around us and also how we perceive it. Inside a government agency like the Department of Health, we work with a lot of data, and that means that we create knowledge. Every time we analyze data, every time we learn something, we're creating knowledge. And as workers in a public agency working for the people of our city, we want to share this knowledge as well as we can. We want to make the data, the knowledge that we create, a tool for everyone else to use as well. And when we do that, when we do a good job of sharing it, then that knowledge becomes more powerful. So our session today is an opportunity to do that. And we're grateful to you all for being here. Uh, secondly, the health department has a huge breadth of data. Uh, some of this includes surveys that are run regularly, surveillance data, which is disease registries, hospital reports, laboratory reports, vital statistics, which are birth and rec uh, death records, uh, and operational data, which is like inspections, operations, other administrative data, and more. There's just an incredible volume of data within our agency. And so accordingly, we have a significant breadth of data products, ways that we offer access to these data and explanation about them. And that's what we're here for. But before we go underway, again, you know, I said that we wanted to offer a bit of our perspective on uh, data. So on the screen is a quote from our former commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, who said that inequities in health are unfair, unnecessary, and avoidable. New York City is one of the most unequal cities in the United States and one of the most segregated. Uh, these everyday realities are reflected in our health. And she said, a more deliberate effort to name and address these disparities will frame all that we do. In New York City, as she said, our neighborhoods are very segregated uh, by race and wealth. Structural racism has led to an inequitable distribution of resources and opportunity, and this inequity leads to unequal health outcomes. Uh, good health is determined not only by our personal choices, but very much so by structural forces, policies, historical and current practices that shape our world. And that awareness is, in a nutshell, public health. It's looking upstream to factors outside of our personal practices and into our collective practices that shape our health. So in public health, we have an obligation to identify these forces, and data is a powerful tool to help us do this, to identify, name, shed a light on the injustices that shape our world uh, and cause unequal opportunity for health in our world. With that as our introduction and our perspective on data, I can turn things over to my colleague, Regina, uh, to talk about New York City open data resources. Hi, everybody. I'm Regina Zimmerman I'm from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, I'm in a unit called Data Governance and Informatics. And um, part of our unit's responsibilities is to coordinate open data for the DOHMH, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. You're likely all familiar with open data or are learning about it this week. Um, open data started with Local Law 11 and it went into effect in, January, in February 2012. And the law requires that all city agencies make their public data available online through a single online open data portal. Yet prior and leading up to this law, the Department of Health had already been making health data accessible to the public through our public health website, epi query system, and through various publications, including our vital signs and city health information, which is most of which can be seen on this slide. And since the 2000s, the health department has added other mechanisms for providing health information to our constituents, including other new publications like something called the Epi Data Brief and Community Health Profiles, um, a CDC supported environmental and data health data portal, and something called the Data Catalog, which provides descriptions of our data sources and contacts to access them if they're permitted to be disclosed. Some of these tools will be discussed today and are used to make to tell the story behind the data available. The data available in these systems and in publications are derived from the department's underlying data assets, many of which are protected under privacy, security, or HIPAA protections, and therefore can't altogether be made 
access to the uh, accessible to the public. Open data provides New York City with that single portal, like I said, to streamline the constituent access to intergovernment data, including the health departments. And through the story behind the health data, although the story behind the health data is not contained on open data, open data provides that data without risking data privacy and confidentiality and enables you, the constituent, to access and analyze the data yourself perhaps even to use it to create some economic opportunities or to promote some innovative strategies for your work in our city. Complying with open data requires intra and interagency coordination and communications. You might know that the health department is a very large agency with over 7,000 employees. Most department data assets are managed by individual data teams or data stewards in different bureaus and divisions. The open data coordinator here seen in the center works with divisions and bureau liaisons who in turn work with the actual data stewards. And please note that all the department's data assets are not listed on this slide. It would be even harder to read than it is now. Here we see data from our disease control, environmental health, epidemiology, survey, and administrative areas. But health department has additional division data with additional data assets, some from an area called family and child health, mental hygiene, and health equity and community wellness, as well as emergency preparedness. The department has currently 77 data sets on open data, and it continues to grow. To maintain DOHMH data on open data, the coordinator annually reviews the department's data assets with divisions and data steward representatives. They determine whether a data asset in total or in part can be made accessible to the public, given the department resources and data confidentiality policies. And if so, the data stewards prepare the data along with open data standard file layouts and data descriptions to be posted. Some data is updated annually and others with more frequency, some even daily. The coordinator works with stewards and concurrently works with the department's freedom of information officer, the privacy officer and the communications officer, as well as the mayor's office of operations and the city's department of IT. Some of the data that you find on open data is available on our website, often in another format. And today you will hear about these other formats, including the health department's EpiQuery environmental portal publications and are also our GitHub COVID data added due to the urgency of making these pandemic data more timely. Other data meet the requirements of open data may only be found on open data. As I said before, every year the health department re-reviews our internal data assets, new and old, to determine what meets open data criteria, and we work to make them available. If you go to the open data website, you can find out information about our data. Among our 77 health department post posted data sets, for instance, the five most popular data sets, well, let me just actually transfer right over to our website and we can see because sometimes these change. Okay, so this is uh, the open data website. And if we go directly to the data, let's, let's search for DOHMH. If you notice here on the left are the categories, you click on health. And if we wanna look at the most access, which is the most popular, we can see that those, the ones that are most frequently sought after or looked at are the New York City leading causes of death, the Department of Health New York City restaurant inspection results, COVID-19 daily counts of cases and hospitalizations of deaths, and popular baby names, which come from our registry of births in New York City. Right here, we can also look at the most recently added data sets. So most recently added was um, COVID concentration measurements in New York City wastewater, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, DOHMH Pool Inspections, Hyperlocal Temperature Monitoring, and the 2017 to 19 New York City Kids Survey. So you can tell just by the titles of these, the breadth of the types of data that the health department posts on open data. But the things that people have been most interested this year have been in COVID. So let's take a look at that. And these have all been posted pretty much in the past year. And many of these are updated daily. 
like the COVID-19 daily counts of cases, hospitalizations, and death, COVID-19 outcomes by testing cohorts, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, COVID-19 antibody by borough, COVID-19 expenditure reports, and COVID antibody by age. And there are numerous others for COVID. Hi, everyone. My name is Martha Alexander. And thanks, Regina. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm the Data Communications Outreach Analyst in the Division of Epidemiology at the Health Department. And I do believe that all of us in public health have an obligation to call out injustice and work towards health equity. And what what is exciting to me that we can use data as a tool for advancing health equity. So I'm going to tell you about some of the resources that we have um, publicly available on the health department website at nyc.gov slash health slash data. We know that partners like other city agencies, community-based organizations, and students, researchers, and reporters access this data. You can use the data for activities like research, grant writing, policy, formation, programming direction, and evaluation. Our tagline um, on the website and our data tools is hundreds of stories, one place to start. We want this to make it easier to translate data into stories and to bring awareness to inequities across the city. So that's why we make it, try to make it easy to find and use the data. So let's start at the data tab, nyc.gov slash health slash data. Let's see. Um, this shows how you'll see the three options on that page, interact and visualize, data sets, or publications. I'll tell you a bit more about each of these options. So publications, you should, I would recommend always starting here if you have a research question, because you might find something has been written about, um, about your question already. A lot of our publications focus on, focus their analysis on health equity. Some of them highlight our research methodologies like the EPI research report um, and how we use data. There are several new publications this year on the impact of COVID-19 on uh, New Yorkers. We also put out special reports, some like specific disease reports like this hepatitis free New York City, and um, others feature in-depth analyses of data related to specific populations. The most recent example is the health of Asians and Pacific Islanders in New York City. It focuses on the social determinants of health and well-being and health outcomes of Asian and Pacific Islander New Yorkers. The next uh, tab on the data tab is data sets. So if you want to do analysis, um, this is where to go. You can view and download survey data files, documentation, questionnaires, and sample SAS programs for analysis. These are great resources for data analysts and for students. On this tab, you'll also find a link to the data catalog that Regina mentioned, which lists all of the publicly available health department data resources. So not Obviously not every data set is available publicly, but this is the data catalog is a way to figure out what's available. And some of the popular data sets on this part of the website are those for child health data, the community health survey, and the youth risk behavior survey. The final third uh, of those three tabs is the interact and visualize. This includes our three main data tools, which are EpiQuery, the community health profiles, and the environment and health data portal. Each of these tools is different, but the general idea is the same. They aim to make it easier for anyone to access and use health department data, regardless of their skill with using data. These tools also allow us to see how much health can vary by neighborhood. Many New York City neighborhoods, as Matthew said, have high rates of poverty and limited access to resources that promote health. This is due to policies and practices based on history of racism and discrimination. One note is that we should interpret the data in these tools with the understanding that good health is determined not only by our personal choices, but also by past and current discrimination based on things like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, and um, other identities. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about EpiQuery and the community health profiles, and then Matthew will um, take it back and tell you about the environment and health data portal. So first I wanna tell you about EpiQuery, which is our powerhouse data tool. EpiQuery presents um, health data from various sources in one centralized location. And you can use this quick link here to access EpiQuery, nyc.gov slash health slash EpiQuery. So we can use EpiQuery to analyze the demographics and look for trends over time. As for uh, the geography, most of the data are presented in UHF, um, United Hospital Fund neighborhoods, but we're working on making data available by community district in two year periods. You can also look at data by borough. And you'll see that on the EpiQuery homepage, you can search by topic, data source, or indicator. Some of the topics include 
diseases and conditions, mental health, and healthcare access and use. Here's an overview of the data in EpiQuery. Um, it's, it's a lot. As I mentioned, it includes data from surveys, vital statistics, and surveillance. Most of these data sets are available back to 2002 or so. Um, that's when it started. Um, and new years of data are added as soon as they're cleaned and prepared to be added here. I'd like to give you a couple examples of how you can use EpiQuery. So the first is to look at trends over time. We can look at um, for the first example is community health survey data related to blood pressure. The survey asks respondents to um, say, have you ever been told you have high blood pressure, like by a doctor? Um, and so then the, the response we have in EpiQuery is basically for those, have you been told you have high blood pressure? Yes or no. Um, and when we look at the community health survey data from 2005, compared to 2017, it's really just about the same. So we can say that the overall prevalence of New Yorkers who have been told they have high blood pressure has remained stable from 29.1% in 2005 to 28% in 2017. So that's a trend over time. We can also analyze by demographics in EpiQuery. So an, um, this is a similar question where it's asking sort of a self-report on whether you have health insurance. So I just looked at our demographic overview um, on the indicator overview page in EpiQuery and found that in 2017, overall 88% of New York City adults reported having, okay. Um, so in 2017, overall 88% of New York City adults reported having a health insurance policy. But when you look at that by female and male, um, by sex, it's for female New Yorkers, it was 91% and for male, it was 85%. I was able to look, um, of course, if you want to make sure this is actually a significant difference, you can look at the confidence intervals, or you can do the, you can test the statistical significance in EpiQuery. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see that this is a significant difference. And um, of course, we, we say hundreds of stories, one place to start. And with this one, I find I really want to know more, you know, I really want to know what's going on. So um, it's a really interesting jumping off point to, to uh, try to figure out why that's such a large difference. The next tool I want to tell you about is the community health profiles. We also have a quick link for this, nyc.gov slash health slash profiles. The, these profiles were developed to demonstrate that our health starts where we live and work and play. They help us get a better sense of the challenges and assets in each community. They give an overview of health for each of New York City's 59 community districts. If you have ever um, heard of your community board or gone to a community board meeting, um, that group is that represents your community district. The profiles incorporate topics ranging from social and economic conditions to health access and care. And the sources include, um, there's a, a lot of sources including the American Community Survey, the Community Health Survey, Vital Statistics, and hospitalization records. Here's a couple of examples of how you might use the community health profiles in your projects. Um, the first section of the profiles is called who we are. And um, one of the questions is just basically just like self-reported health. So you could use that to give basically context and background. Um, and this the example here is that 71% of the 112,388 people living in Bushwick reported that their own health was good, very good or excellent. So that gives you something interesting to um, to say about Bushwick. You could also compare it to other neighborhoods and see like um, how people in Bushwick feel compared to other neighborhoods. The other example here is um, using those really handy uh, tools within community health profiles to compare neighborhoods. So um, we can see that the rate of preterm births in East Harlem is higher than the citywide rate. And we'd be able to look at other neighborhoods too and see um, where the rates of preterm birth are higher or lower. And that would translate to um, serving as evidence of need. For example, if you're like writing a grant application um, and you wanna say like, we need more services, we need more access to care. Uh, we need something in this neighborhood to try to, um, to eliminate the problem with preterm births. And as Matthew said, um, data are knowledge and the knowledge we create is most powerful when we do a good job sharing it. So you can use these features throughout the uh, data tools I mentioned to download or share or print the data. For example, you could print an analysis and take it to the community board meeting um, to advocate for your community, or you could link to a particular analysis if you're writing a paper and you want to show like how you compared, um, you know, say diabetes to certain demographics or um, geographical measures, you could do that and print out just that one page or share the link to just that analysis. 
So thank you. That's EpiQuery and the Community Health Profiles. And now I'd like to pass the baton back to Matthew to talk about the Environment and Health Data Portal. All right. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, yeah, so I work on a site called the Environment and Health Data Portal, which is one of the department's uh, data communication tools. And a brief background um, on this tool is that it's built by a program within uh, our agency called the Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, which is funded by uh, a CDC tracking network. And the goal of this is to monitor how environments affect health, to make these data easy to access, understand, and use, and in doing so, use these data to inform policy and practice. And now there are a few key components uh, of our site. It's not an exhaustive library of data sets, um, unlike some of the department's other data tools, but rather a curated collection uh, of data sets. And some of these uh, are data from other sources. So it's not just health department data. And the reason that we do that is that we're really trying to show connections between environments and health, ways that uh, the environment determines our health, uh, the health of the city, and the health of different communities within it. Uh, the link to this site is on your screen, and perhaps one of uh, my co-hosts would be so kind as to drop the link into the chat. Um, and I'll just talk you briefly through a few of the different products that we have on this site. First, we've got uh, what's called our data explorer. This lets you browse the data sets that we have on the site, view visualizations, including maps and uh, trend charts, uh, and you can download these data. Um, there are some 250 indicators that span uh, 50 different topics, things like the built environment, housing, asthma, air quality, water quality, cancer, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's quite a lot, so I encourage you to explore. Secondly, we also have these neighborhood reports. Now, these put our data into specific topic-related contexts. So we have different reports for asthma, housing and health, outdoor air and health, climate and health, uh, and active design. And these show how the different environmental indicators and health outcomes are related for your neighborhood and then compared to the city as a whole. Lastly, uh, our other content site are data stories. And these are narratives that help shine a light on the data. Um, I think that anyone who's browsing an unfamiliar data site is likely to have, possibly, uh, possibly likely to have a similar experience that I have where I think, what am I looking for? What, what's going on here? Um, we decided that we wanted to really help point people in the direction of things that we thought were uh, important, urgent, or meaningful. And we do so by writing these data stories, these sort of brief narratives of what's going on in the data, what's important. Um, and, and what are the things that we think are really worth drawing attention to. So I encourage you all uh, to explore our site and explore the items that we have on it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, our priority here is really making these data easy to access, understand, and use. So we're working to create a website that is useful to you all, that explains these data in different ways, um, and in doing so uh, reflects work with our users on the vision, design, uh, and function of our website. Um, like I said, we want to be building something that's very useful to you. And so as I'm wrapping up this brief section here, I'll mention a plug uh, that because of all that, we're working on a redesign of this site. Here's a little preview up on your screen. Uh, and we would love to add you to our email list. There are opportunities for user research and some very occasional uh, announcements. And so if you're interested in providing that level of feedback, um, then I will drop a sign up list into uh, the chat uh, there for you all. Um, so feel free to click that link and sign up for our email list and feel free to explore our environment and health data portal. Now I'm gonna turn things over also to myself to talk about COVID-19 data resources, um, which is another project that I've worked on here at the department. If I had to guess, I would guess that um, in the past two years, many of the people in this workshop uh, have accessed public health data in one form or another. And I would guess that there's a greater percentage of you all here that have done that in the past two years than at any other point prior, because apparently there's just been a lot of public health going on over the past two years. <laughs> um, so here is our COVID-19 data page. Um, and this is something that, is, uh, that we've worked on and has been a lot of people's first experience browsing health data. And so with that, I wanna give an overview about uh, what, uh, what we call surveillance data are uh, and what we do to them 
uh, to sort of frame why our COVID-19 data products are a little bit different um, from sort of ordinary health department data reporting and data products. So the this, this sort of brief version is that uh, over the past two years, if you've gotten sick uh, and you've gone to get a test, what happens is that that test has been uh, sent to a laboratory for analysis and the results of that test are reported to the State Department of Health and then to the New York City Department of Health. And that's how we get information uh, on positive COVID tests, COVID diagnoses. Um, this, as you can probably guess, has been an incredibly large volume of data. It's coming in every day and it's messy. So our coworkers have the significant challenge of cleaning it, matching it to other data sets and making sense of it and reporting it every day. Um, this has been an urgent situation in which that daily level of situational awareness is important in a way that is perhaps uh, not quite so important for some other conditions. These data really differ from a lot of uh, health departments, other data um, in a few key ways. And first of all, this lag time, this sort of turnaround time between receiving data and reporting it is very short. When we update the data website uh, today, we're going to be reporting data that we received just a couple days ago. And usually, you know, for, for so much of the data that we uh, look at, um, we take a long time to collect the data. We take a long time to clean the data, to analyze it, to consider different methods, and then we report it. And that's that. Um, but with this, that sort of constant loop repeating itself every day is obviously a much shorter turnaround time. So both, of our, la both our lag time and our publication frequency really differ with these COVID data. So that means that the data product differs too. And it also means that some of the meaning in the data changes. Um, the conditions of the pandemic, the systems used to document it, to track it, uh, and the way that we've analyzed the data have changed over time. Um, because what we've published has changed over time, we've tried to document these changes and be transparent. Um, and those changes are important uh, because throughout the pandemic, uh, different data illustrate different things at different points during the pandemic. So the transparency, explanation, and access to these data have been important. Um, so we've created you know, the system where we're publishing uh, what we think are easy to understand visualizations on the website and offer access to the underlying data via a GitHub repository and on open data. And we think that that um, combination approach has been a valuable way to explain what's happening in this city and also offer a deeper level of access uh, to give that knowledge more power and put it in the hands of more people, more analysts, more researchers, more policy professionals, and everyone else in New York who has tried to figure out what's going on uh, throughout this whole pandemic. Um, our goal throughout this has been to deliver a really clear message of our expert understanding. And like I said, to provide information for a range of different audiences and different needs um, so that we can shine a light on the pandemic, prevent further infection and save lives. Um, I always like to drop this tweet in here when I talk, it says, I will let the data speak for itself when it cleans itself. Uh, and I think that's really important um, that not only do we create access to data, but we try and make our expert understanding of it accessible as well. I don't think data are as neutral um, as some people sometimes think they are. I don't really think they're objective. I think that they are product of a, a social process um, and that uh, facts about the process, about their collection, their analysis, really inform what the data say. So I think it's, um, speaking from inside the agency, I think it's really important uh, to communicate what we know about the data. With that, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Ariel Charney, who will go uh, into further depth on some of our COVID data resources, especially vaccination data. Take it away, Ariel. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. My name's Ariel, and I sit in the Bureau of Mental Health, but for the past two years, I've worked on COVID data reporting and our website in collaboration with Matthew and so many others at the agency. So I just want to give them a shout out for all the hard work they've done. Um, so this is just going to give you a walk through one section of our website. Give me one moment. Great. Oh, 
went too far. Okay. So as my colleague Matthew said earlier, we have a rich amount of COVID data available to the public. Um, I'll be diving into vaccine data, which is available on the second tab of our COVID data page. Um, to the right, it's just a screenshot of what's you know, on our website. Um, but beyond vaccines, so much more can be found online. Um, our first tab called latest and fourth tab called trends and totals have data on COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths to date and over time, including a breakdown by vaccination status. Um, the third tab on variants tracks the prevalence of COVID variants, so Delta and Omicron among sequence cases in New York City. And the fifth tab, Data by Zip, provides a profile of your neighborhood when it comes to COVID transmission and vaccination rates. Um, coming back to vaccines, um, which is on the second tab, um, the data comes from the citywide immunization registry, which collects vaccination data on NYC adults and children throughout their lifetime. Um, and our website showcases vaccination rates by demographic group, um, vaccination rates by zip or modzikta slash neighborhood, um, and vaccination treads over time by day. One second. Um, here are snapshots of where we are in our vaccination campaign. And this is at the very top of our website. Um, it's broken out by age, race, ethnicity, and borough. Um, currently, more than 77% of New York City residents are fully vaccinated, a huge milestone, um, but children are lagging at around 56% fully vaccinated. Um, and just as a note, um, at the bottom of all our figures, it's directly connected to a publicly available GitHub repository where you can download the data directly and also find more documentation. So. Disaggregating data has been an important tool since the start of the vaccine campaign to identify disparities in vaccinations. Um, if you can look to the right, um, this sort of shows a breakdown and many stratifications, but overall we see that vaccination rates are lowest in Brooklyn and highest in Manhattan. Um, and rates are lowest among children in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Staten Island, as well as among adult black and white New Yorkers. Looking at these finer cross sections of the data has helped us know where to target community-based outreach and education efforts. Sorry, with the navigation issues. Um, to that point, um, we also have a lot of maps on our website and this has helped bring attention to vaccine inequities by neighborhood related to systemic lack of healthcare access and also distrust in the medical community due to medical racism. Um, looking spatially has helped us understand how patterns in vaccine coverage relate to COVID burden. Um, here on the left, um, you could see COVID hospitaliz hospitalization rates over the last 90 days and to the right, the percent of NYC residents fully vaccinated, um, with the burden, generally speaking, being highest in low vaccination areas, um, such as parts of Brooklyn, Staten Island, and also parts of the Bronx. Geographic data has definitely been tremendously helpful to help inform the placement of vaccination media ads and pop-up vaccine sites, including these mobile bus buses that I'm sure people have seen scattered around their neighborhood um, you know, throughout the vaccination campaign. So next, I'm just gonna, sorry about that. Um, Okay, so next I just wanted to actually preview this really neat tool on our COVID data page. Um, it's called Data by Zip, and I'm not sure actually if I can navigate to it directly here, um, but basically if you go to Data by Zip, you have, the poten you have the ability to type in your neighborhood. So here's my neighborhood. Um, I typed in 11206 in this snapshot, and the neighborhood data profiles gives you um, a summary of where your neighborhood is compared to the rest of the borough and compared to citywide um, you know, numbers around COVID transmission and around vaccination rates. Um, so here you can see that in this neighborhood, 
Um, 66% have at least one dose, and this is lower than the median citywide. Um, and if you go to the page, you can also see a comparison to the rest of Brooklyn. Okay. Um, importantly, we also have data on the trend on trends in doses administered, um, which has often tracked with the expansion of eligibility over time. Um, it's amazing that, you know, somewhere around mid-April, we gave out 120,000 shots in a single day. Um, and you can see here, um, you know, the number of doses administered also went up um, as soon as additional doses became more widely available. Um, here you can also see that, um, you know, you here we track vaccination trends over time by age and race ethnicity. And you can see how the different age groups compare to the citywide number. And a huge focus for us has been on vaccinating school age children. And um, yeah, this has been a very helpful tool to highlight where we need to um, close gaps in coverage. Finally, you're probably wondering where you could find all this data. Um, it is available on our GitHub. If you go to the website, um, you can navigate to the GitHub directly and each of the data, each of the data files that feed a visualization is made available and it's updated daily on weekdays. Um, there's two separate repositories, one for vaccine data and another for COVID hospitalizations cases and deaths. Um, and it is made available to the public. And you can also submit questions on GitHub if people have um, more, if they want more information about, you know, the logic behind some of the data sets. And here are just some of ex some a few examples of our data in action. Um, it's been tremendous to see that our data from GitHub is often taken um, and put on, you know, Gothamist website, the New York Times, in order to spread awareness in terms of where we are in the vaccination campaign, as well as um, cases and hospitalizations. Um, you know, we share the data on our social media to get the word out in terms of, you know, we should vaccinate children. Um, and then also the GitHub data has been used um, in academic articles. Specifically, here's one by Columbia University um, that is on, actually, sorry, by Yale University on um, life saves, saved and hospitalizations averted as a result of the COVID-19 vaccination campaign. And they use our GitHub data um, to do that research. So finally, please visit our COVID data page. The link can be accessed here. And I just am going to wrap up quickly um, by saying, you know, we've gone through a lot of tools and data we make available um, at this agency. A good place to start is going to nyc.gov slash health slash data. And from there, um, it will provide an overview of what we showcase today. So we have um, our community health profiles, our environmental health data portal, um, epi query, um, we have our COVID data page, and also open data. Um, and I'm also providing emails here. If you have questions or want more resources, you can contact um, those emails directly. And finally, there are a number of opportunities uh, available at the New York City Department of Health to gain professional experience. Um, and this is available, a HRTP is available to um, undergraduate and graduate students um, that are currently studying. And then we also have the Public Health Volunteer Corps, um, and they that's available to recent graduates um, from undergrad and graduate school. Um, and you could apply online. Um, the dates are um, on the screen right now. And I really recommend it because um, that is also one of these um, summer internship programs is also how I started um, in public health. Um, so definitely check it out. And finally, I actually just want to um, open the floor to questions. We went over a lot here. Apologies for um, the issues navigating. So thanks for your patience on that. Um, I see a few questions actually. Um, how often are the data sets updated? 
Um, so the COVID data um, is updated daily on weekdays. Um, and then I think Sunday for cases, hospitalizations and deaths as well. And for survey data, for example, it, um, it, it varies, um, you know, based on how often the survey is given and how much time is needed for data cleaning and posting. Someone's asking to see the internship page again. I think I still see it. I'll type the internship website in the chat. And I also want to reinforce um, Jesse Lang's comment about how low vaccine coverage is related to structural barriers and access to care um, and, you know, his history of medical racism. So I just want to ditto that comment. Um, that is very much true. So we're open to questions. If people have questions. We have about seven, eight, seven, six minutes left. <clears throat> I just clicked on the link that I think you put up for the internship, and it says that it's out of date and not working. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll check it, see what I can do. Sorry. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're sorry you have reached an outdated or non-existing page. It could be an iPhone issue. Yeah, I would try the link that Matthew just shared. That one. Okay. Should... Yeah. So I'm seeing a Thank question you. in the chat uh, from someone who says, uh, from Ryan Berger, who says, on several occasions, I've encountered news articles and presentations by the mayor's office that discuss vaccination rates among city employees by agency. Is that type of data uh, controlled or prepared by DOHMH or by another agency? Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's uh, prepared by DOH, though I'm not certain. Uh, Ariel, can you speak to that? Yeah, so that data um, is released by the mayor's office, not from the Department of Health, but we provide and help, um, you know, come up with those numbers that is using CIR, CIR data. So it's not regularly updated. Matthew, would you like to speak to Ezra's question? I think um, I'll have an sure. answer too, but... It's yeah, you know, I think I think we all might uh, have something to say in response to this. So Ezra writes, how do folks who curate the data websites think about prioritizing new features? For example, is adding a new data set versus cleaning and adding attributes to an existing data set versus making data more accessible? To what extent is public feedback a driver for prioritization decisions? Uh, that's a great question, you know, and I, I can speak to my experience on the environment and health data portal um, that we have really tried to do uh, extensive user research um, to understand uh, what types of questions people have and how data can be structured and formatted and delivered um, so that it can best answer their questions. Um, I can't really speak to our success doing that just yet, and I think that some of the changes we have on the horizon um, will hopefully reflect that process. Um, but that's been really important. You know, I, I think that it's I think that data are often seen as uh, the domain of the expert. And I think that that is um, partially because historically, uh, people who work with data don't do a great job communicating it. They don't do a great job communicating uh, the knowledge. They might not do a great job with the technology required to make the data easier to access, understand, and use. But that's something that I and my coworkers are really passionate about. So we think that uh, when we prepare information in ways that people can understand, then they will understand it. And if we look to public feedback to understand what people are curious about, what people can use and what people are interested in, then we can figure out how to answer their questions and create a product that's useful for people. Um, do, my, do my colleagues on this panel have other uh, thoughts about that question? I mean, I would say that resources are also part of the decision making mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, what, what to do first. So um, that unfortunately sometimes makes a lot of the decisions for us. But um, we also do, like Matthew said, you know, we speak to people who use the data and figure out, you know, what are we hearing a lot of questions about? What do people want to know about? How do people want the data organized for one thing? You know, like what geographies are helpful? Um, what data are important? So that does make a difference in how we present the data. You know, like the, if you look at the data sets that are available on our data sets tab, that's slightly different from how we would, um, what we would pull into EpiQuery for everyone to use. So we want to make sure that the most useful data are available to everyone according to what people ask for. 
Yeah, and I definitely try, especially for at least the vaccine data to monitor what inquiries we're getting um, through either our GitHub um, ticket system um, where people can submit questions um, and also just from the press, um, from other external, um, you know, external groups that pose questions to our press office. So that has helped shape like what we actually publish. I just want to reiterate um, also how complex and large the health department is. Um, in terms of coordinating and presenting these data, we have so many different data assets. And as far as open data is concerned, we do an assessment every year of what can be made available. And, um, and we work with all of our different data stewards across the board to make them available. Um, I see a question um, from Jesse around if there's um, information about people with missing demographic um, data, and that is available on our GitHub um, for race, ethnicity, sex, and a bunch of other measures, you can see how many people have, um, you know, that information missing, and it's not included um, in the percentages. But you can get the numerator and denominator on GitHub. Here's an interesting question from Kate who asks, how can the open data community support your data work? I think that's a great question. And I'd love to hear uh, my colleagues thoughts on the matter. Um, that's a tough one to answer. I mean, we, we are required by law to have a, a data coordinator for the agency. Um, that's one person, um, but there's no, um, <clears throat> resources in place otherwise. Um, and so that person works with all of our data stewards uh, requesting that they make these data assets available in addition to what we already do. So resources probably would be my, <laughs> my biggest uh, ask resources to help um, us coordinate and prepare the data. Also, you have to realize that um, the data that is made available through open data has to be tailored to the specifications by the portal. Um, and so it's slightly less versatile than the data that we might put out um, on our uh, internally in our different different programs. If I go back to that chart, you have to realize that those all, you know, different programs have their data stored separately, have analysts that manage them separately. Um, so it's it's a lot of organization to, to try to bring that all together into formats that can be presented in one way. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. I, I'd say for, um, for my purposes and for the purposes of uh, EpiQuery and the community health profiles, it's very helpful to talk with people about these resources because that's, I mean, that's my job for one. And that's like, they won't be any good if we don't have a sort of feedback, you know, from people who are actually using them. So just this um, connecting with everyone is very helpful in terms of making sure that the resources make sense and they're getting the right data to the right people. And um, I will send out an email later this week with um, information about our mailing lists and um, links to all the all the things we linked to and um, the slides and everything. So don't worry about um, if you didn't write anything down, but you'll see all the opportunities sort of to follow up with us and, um, and to stay in contact. I see a question about the open data COVID wastewater. Um, we actually, um, the stewards need to answer the individual questions about the data. They're not um, presenting here, but there is um, an email that you can get to to open data and it will come to us and we'll share it with the steward to get your questions answered. Awesome, well, this was a great event, thank you.